On today's episode of What's Going On With Shipping, Sealift and the Great White Fleet. I'm your host, Sal Mercagliano. Welcome to this special episode. So, start of the series talking about Sealift, the civilian application of shipping to a military purpose. And this is a topic that's really dear to my heart because this is what I've done my graduate and professional writing on, the role of commercial shipping in national defense. And I'm taking you through basically my studies, which started the Spanish-American War and went all the way up to the Iraq War. So we're going to look at a series of scenarios and events that took place and study them in detail. And today we're looking at the Great White Fleet. Now, the Great White Fleet is a unique event in the history of the United States. Teddy Roosevelt, 1907, decides to send a, not a, the entire U.S. fleet, 16 battleships. Now, this is prior to the creation of the Dreadnoughts. So these are all pre-Dreadnoughts. But he decides to send literally the core of the U.S. fleet, 16 battleships, out from Hampton Roads, Virginia, on a initially it was going to be just to the west coast but then he changes it into a circumnavigation of the planet and this event is massive in its scope and scale nobody had really tried to do a circumnavigation of the globe with a battle fleet before what was in the heads of everyone's mind had happened just two years before when the russian navy sent their fleet from the baltic from the black sea around Africa and Asia to battle the Japanese during the Russo-Japanese War. The Japanese had launched an attack against Port Arthur. This was a northern port in China. The, the, the area was held by the Russians. The Japanese launched a surprise attack on the Russian fleet there and with torpedoes and later destroyed most of the Pacific fleet and bottled it up. And so the Russians had to dispatch their own fleet on this epic voyage around the world. And let me be clear, it was a catastrophe from the beginning. It did not work well at all. You know, when the, the ship sailed out of the Baltic into the North Sea, they thought they were being attacked by Japanese torpedo boats in the North Sea and actually shot up a group of English fishing boats, actually sinking one, killing two English sailors, almost precipitated a war with Great Britain. It forced the Baltic fleet to have to sail all the way around Africa. And then you get the Battle of Tsushima, where literally the entire Russian fleet is annihilated, almost nothing left. And this disaster of the Russian fleet was in the back of everyone's minds two years later when Teddy Roosevelt decides to send the Great White Fleet, on this circumnavigation. Now, there's this military application, but there's also a political issue, and that is the fear of the Japanese in the Pacific. There is a lot of racism rolling around in the United States, particularly against the Japanese. We'd seen it earlier against Chinese under the Chinese Exclusion Act, and now in 1907 we're seeing it with the Japanese Exclusion Act. And so there's a lot of racism, fear, that the Japanese are going to be a major player in the Pacific, and therefore we have to exert our dominance. This is also prior to the Panama Canal, and one of the things they're trying to do is really emphasize the need for a canal through the Panama Isthmus to connect the Atlantic with the Pacific and avoid a voyage all the way around South America. Now, the sea lift aspect of this comes from a fleet of naval colliers, which are crewed by civilian merchant mariners. And this all starts in 1899, when the Secretary of the Navy employs a master to crew and, and man the collier USS Alexander. And the Alexander becomes the first vessel to be crewed by this civilian crew. Now, during the Spanish-American War, there were two vessels, the Nashon and the Zavario, which were chartered they were British ships. They were chartered by Commodore Dewey during the action at Manila Bay to carry stores and coal. But one of the things that we found out is once you go to war under treaties, the Hague Treaty and a series of other treaties, you can't depend on foreign supply sources for your coal. 
And so the U.S. now, after the Spanish-American War, have overseas bases, and they have a large presence, particularly in the Pacific. We've annexed the Philippines, we've annexed Hawaii, we've annexed Guam, and we have this long chain of bases. However, fuel for all the Navy vessels at this time is coal, and all Navy coal comes from the east coast of the United States, the Appalachian Mountains. That is the fuel source for it. And so you've got to get coal from the mountains of West Virginia, Pennsylvania, Virginia, Maryland, down to the water and then across the sea. And so you need to haul this coal across great distances, including the voyage the Alexander undertakes, which is from Norfolk, Virginia, through the Mediterranean, through the Red Sea, via the Suez Canal, through the Indian Ocean, to the Philippines. And so the U.S. Navy embarks on this system to replace the Navy crews on board their colliers with civilian crews. They also experiment with underway replenishment, an attempt to refuel vessels at sea by coal. This is one of the earliest such experiments between the battleship USS Massachusetts and the collier USS Marcellus. This rig right here is really a, a precursor for the way modern replenishment is done. Now, in this case, this is an astern refueling. In other words, the Massachusetts is actually towing the Marcellus. But to get a, a tensioned rig, something that you see today in modern alongside refuelings, the Massachusetts ran a wire back to the Marcellus. They ran it through the rigging. And then off the stern of the vessel, they dragged what was called a sea anchor. This is lar a large bag. And that large bag kind of drags that, that wire and tightens it up. And you have basically a modern stream rig. But in this case, it's created by the drag of the ocean. The, the problem with underway replenishment this time was you can never shuttle enough coal over fast enough to really replenish a vessel. It's just due to the inefficiency of coal. And so this experiment is put aside. But in World War I, we'll see underway replenishment be implemented, but this time with fuel ships transferring oil, vice coal, and they'll do it alongside versus forward and astern. So the U.S. establishes what's called the Collier Service in 1899, and it morphs into something in 1907 called the Navy Auxiliary Service. And the Navy Auxiliary Service is exactly what it sounds like. All the colliers and the fuel vessels are crewed by civilians. Navy will crew the store ships. And the plan was for all these vessels to eventually go over to civilian manning, much like we see today in the U.S. Navy's modern military sea lift command, where one out of five ships in the U.S. Navy are crewed by merchant mariners of the United States. But in 1907, here you see the disposition of these ships. So ACs are colliers, AOs are oilers, these are oil ships, and then AFs are store ships. And the vast majority of the U.S. fleet is in the Atlantic, where you expect it to see. But you'll notice there's one in the Philippines. This is for shuttling coal around the Philippines, and then six in the Pacific. Now, remember, the Panama Canal is not open at this time. And so those nine colliers in the Atlantic would load coal and undertake a voyage eastward through the Mediterranean, through the Indian Ocean, to the Philippines, and dump off coal in the Philippines to replenish the naval squadron that was based in the Pacific. These were mainly armored cruisers. The colliers of the Pacific fleet would head out to the Philippines, grab the coal that had been delivered there, and then bring it back, drop some off in Hawaii, and bring the rest back to California. This was a really long supply line. You would not ship coal across on the inter in the uh, across on the Intercontinental Railroad until 1916. There's just not enough rail capacity to move sufficient amount of coal. And then later on, you would use the Panama Canal when it opens in 1914. So this passage here, I know it's hard to read. You're not going to be able to read it here. This is from Duncan Ballantyne's uh, A Logistics in Naval War. And this is really the document that is really the pre... It is the text by which everybody writes about the Great White Fleet, particularly about logistics. So I'm going to read just a couple of passages here from pages 17 and 18. The cruise of the fleet around the world from 1907 to 1909 illustrates how much logistical progress had been made during the first decade of the 20th, uh, 20th century. It goes on here 
whatever the political issues involved, the professional naval interest in the cruise was probably well described by Mahan. This is Alfred Thayer Mahan, who professed to see it merely a practice cruise in what would now be called fleet logistics. It goes on here to say the mere fact of staying at sea made the Navy a seagoing force. When it comes to underway replenishment, this is what he has to say, and this is on page 18. Our own Navy colliers delivered coal to the fleet only at two ports, Trinidad and Rio de Janeiro, early in the voyage. These are on the Atlantic side. Thereafter, the fleet was dependent upon chartered colliers, its own coaling stations, and other foreign sources. Of the total of 434,906 tons of coal delivered to the cruising units, 9% were on board when the fleet left Hampton Road. 8% was furnished by Navy colliers, 10% was furnished from Navy stores in Cavite in the Philippines and in Honolulu, and 73% was delivered from foreign sources. Even in San Francisco, the fleet received its coal from British and Norwegian ships and contractors. And that's the theme you hear about this fleet, is that the entire fleet was replenished largely by civilian commercial vessels, but largely from foreign nations. So the U.S. Navy and its epic around-the-world crews was dependent on foreign shipping. And while that is completely true, let me be clear, these numbers are exactly right. I've gone back and I've looked at the statistics that Duncan Ballantyne got this from, and those numbers are perfectly correct. I think there's a misjudgment here, and let me explain why. So this is the cruise of the Great White Fleet. This is the uh, voyage they undertake here uh, around the world. They will leave from Hampton Roads, Virginia, uh, right here, and embark on a cruise around South America, through the Straits of Magellan, up along the west coast of South America, to the west coast of the United States. They'll hit a series of ports along the west coast of the United States, head across to Hawaii, and then down to New Zealand, Australia, the Philippines, Japan, and China, through Singapore, stop at Ceylon, Sri Lanka, into the Mediterranean, very brief stops in the Mediterranean for several ships, and race back before Teddy Roosevelt leaves office in 1909. It's a really epic uh, voyage here. And the voyage takes part in a couple of ways. So they mentioned about coal being prepositioned. So there's two coal sources the U.S. can draw upon. That's the coal at Honolulu and those in Conviti. They don't draw upon coal stores on the west coast of the United States, largely because once you deplete those, they're really hard to fill. And so the U.S. decides that they're going to use other means to do this. So when the ship takes off, you'll see that there is a fleet of vessels that will contribute to it. So you'll notice the flags there, a grand total of nine U.S. flag vessels, 42 British vessels, seven Norwegian and one Austrian vessel. So we're talking about nearly 60 ships involved here to replenish the 16 battleships of the U.S. fleet. And it's not the same 16 battleships throughout. There's actually two that swap out on the West Coast, but the two other ones continue on. There's armored cruisers that sail with part of them. There's a destroyer flotilla, but it's a fairly substantial fleet. And so here's the voyage taking place with each of the stops along the way. So the two stops at Trinidad and at Rio on the east side of the Americas will be handled largely by the American colliers, those nine colliers that provide coal for the U.S. fleet. So ships like the Ajax, the Brutus, the Caesar, the Hannibal, the Leonidas, the Marcellus, the Nero, and the Sterling. And can I be clear what rocking names colliers have using Roman names and god names from Roman and Greek mythology? Just great names. Will basically provide that supplemented by several British and Norwegian vessels. Now, it's at this point you should figure something out. So there's a grand total of nine colliers on the Atlantic side. And as you see here, about three of them go down the Trinidad, six head down to Rio. And if you're going to use those nine colliers to replenish the American fleet, they're going to dump their coal into the ships at those sites. And then they're going to have to sail back to the United States, load back up with this coal, this Pocahontas, this Stones River. This is coal from specific 
uh, mines only that the U.S. is using and then come back. The U.S. fleet will never get around the world fast if every time it replenishes, it's going to have to wait for the colliers to sail back to the United States and come back. It's almost impossible for the U.S. to do this on its own with the number of ships it has. And even if it doubled, tripled the number of ships it had, it was going to be extremely different, difficult. So what happens here is those nine colliers minus one, one of them, the Ajax, actually sails with the fleet around the world, although you'll never see a mention of her. She is not mentioned in almost any study, but the Ajax, with its civilian crew, will sail around with the Great White Fleet. The other eight colliers head back to the east coast of the United States, and they begin the process of replenishing coal, again, back out in Convedi. They also load up with coal should they have to go to the relief of the Great White Fleet. Should the Great White Fleet find itself stranded somewhere without coal, it has to be loaded up to be able to go get them. So they transit through the, uh, the Straits of Magellan and head up the West Coast, largely serviced by foreign vessels as they head up there, Part particularly off the coast of Mexico, where there's a big gunnery shoot takes place. But they're using foreign vessels. And notice they're using British and Norwegian vessels. Why are they not using U.S. vessels? This is an easy answer here. The U.S. Merchant Marine at this time is the third largest in the world behind Great Britain and Germany. However, they're not going to be able to get American ships to load coal, sail all the way around South America and offload it in Mexico, the West Coast of the United States or the West Coast of South America because there's no profitability in this. It would be way too expensive because the American ships would have to sail back empty. There is no cargo for them. Colliers are basically regular cargo ships. They just load coal into their hold. The British and Norwegian ships are operating on the free ocean. They're basically looking for cargo everywhere. And since they're British ships largely, they can grab cargo from within the empire. It's easy for them to do. American ships don't want to sail thousands of miles out of their way, make one-way load or one-way a trip, and come back in ballast, empty, not making money. And so it's British and largely Norwegian vessels that will make this, this voyage. Uh, the ships continue on. They head to Hawaii. They'll replenish largely from there, from the Hawaiian stocks, and go to New Zealand to draw from Royal Navy stocks, which was a big, big issue. And so they're going to pull a big amount of, of coal here in Australia from those stocks. Uh, they continue their voyage to the west coast of Australia, to the Philippines, up to Japan, and then across the Indian Ocean. And when they get into the Suez Canal at Alexandria, they draw one of their biggest loads. They actually replenish nearly the entire fleet at that point. They load up with coal. They are basically good to go at this point. They're going to set sail in Gibraltar. They're actually met by one of the Navy colliers, and they get across just in time for the uh, arrival in Hampton Roads before Teddy Roosevelt leads office. And one of the things that I think you get the narrative here that the U.S. Navy was bereft of colliers, it was bereft of fuel ships, is because the Navy wants colliers. They want more fuel ships. They want to increase the fleet. And one of the things you see in the 1908 uh, uh, budget is money put aside for new colliers, and you'll see it in both in 1908 and 1911. So in 1908, it's actually the 1909 physical year. There are proposals put forward by the Navy to build six new colliers, six to add to the fleet. This is the Cyclops, the Neptune, the Jupiter, the Vulcan, the Mars, and the Hector. Now, these ships are really unique for a variety of reasons. The first three, the Cyclops, the Neptune, and the Jupiter, What's interesting about them is that two of them will actually be Navy crews and one will be civilian. So the uh, Neptune uh, will be a Navy crew. The Jupiter will be a Navy crew. The Cyclops will be a civilian crew. And that's because of the propulsion plants. The Navy decides not just to build colliers, but also to experiment with new means of propulsion. The Jupiter will have a new uh, uh, turboelectric 
method of propulsion where their its engine plants generate electricity and the electricity will power generators that in turn turn the props. The Neptune will have steam turbines, something we haven't really seen a lot in the U.S. Navy at this time, not big steam turbines. And Cyclops will have a regular conventional triple, triple reciprocating engine. And we see this across the auxiliary fleet. The Navy will use the auxiliary fleet to try out new methods a propulsion. You'll also notice that these vessels are rigged much different than previous colliers. Previous colliers had a center house with a series of holes forward and after the house. That allows you to use about 50% of the available hull space for coal. The new colliers have a house all the way forward and the engine space all the way aft. That allows you to use 75% of the, the volume of the ship for coal. They also had an innovative way to deliver the coal. Instead of using booms with pick and stays, they came up with these big clamshells and those masts with those multiple booms right there allow you through a series of winches to actually use your clamshell bucket to scoop up coal, swing it over the side of the ship and load it either on the dock or onto another vessel. So those six ships were the first of a wave of them that came in. In 1911, four more, the Proteus, the Nursus, the Orion, and the Jason are also added. So these are 10 ships added in a very short period of time. And what this does is gives the U.S. Navy mobility, something it was desperately needing. It proved it could sail around the world. It proved it can maintain its discipline. It proved it can be effective in shooting. But most importantly of all, it proved now the logistics. Yes, 73% of that coal came either from foreign ships or foreign stocks. But if it did it again in 1911, it'd be a much different scenario. Add to it shortly thereafter in 1913, you see the first fuel ships, tankers, the Kanawa and the Maumi will come on. The U.S. is cognizant of the fact that it needs shipping to support its battle fleet. And this is commercial shipping that's being done. What's interesting is up until the U.S. enters World War I in 1917, those vessels will largely remain civilian crewed. It's only in May, May 7th of 1917, that the decision is made to remove the crews from the civilian vessels and replace them with military vessels. Ironically, most of the officers, the masters, the chief engineers, the mates and the engineers were given reserve commissions under a new program created in 1916. So those civilian masters became lieutenant commanders in the Navy Reserve and took over the very ships they had been captaining for the U.S. Navy, but now they are members of the U.S. Navy. So the Great White Fleet, we tend not to think about it too much when it comes to sea lift, but it was a huge sea lift operation. Civilian shipping and civilian logistics were essential to prove that the U.S. could do something the Russians couldn't do, and that is deploy a fleet around the world, maintain its integrity, support it logistically, and ensure when it arrived back at its home base after nearly two years, it was fit to fight. And I think that's a great demonstration of logistics and sea lift. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. If you did, take a moment, subscribe to the channel, hit the bell, so be alerted about new videos as they come out. Leave a comment. Hey, wait, did I miss something? Please tell me. Go in. We're going to continue our discussion about sea lift throughout the 20th century as the series continues on. And if you're new to the channel, hey, subscribe and hit the bell, so you'll be alerted about new videos as they come out. And if you can, support the page. How do you do that? You can hit the super thanks button below, which allows you to contribute directly to the page or head on over to Patreon. You'll see a link at the end of the video where you can become a monthly or yearly subscriber to Patreon or down in the show notes. Until the next video, this is Sal, signing off.